Salam Hatan Santani, I'm the Editorial Director of The Real Deal. It's been a really fun afternoon already. We've had some amazing interviews, and we're here now to talk about the residential market from the perspective of the men and women who sell it. So on my extreme right is Rafael De Niro of Douglas Solomon. Rafael, according to The Real Deal's rankings, the number one agent in New York City in 2017, uh, with over 700 million in sell-side deals. So Rafael, thank you for being with us. Those are the only stats I'm going to throw out. Everyone else here is leading a brokerage. Suffice to say that they're all top brokerages, they're all dealing top-end product, and they've all dealt with various challenges uh, in terms of staffing, in terms of recruitment, in terms of a slower or changing market. So we're just going to introduce them by name. To Raphael's left is Chloe Peters, who's the president of Warburg Realty. She's She sounds like she's got a bigger entourage than Raphael, so congratulations. Claire is also the co-founder of a tech accelerator incubator called Metaprops. And thank you for being with us. I look forward to chatting with you. On her left is Bess Friedman, who is the co-president. Who recently became co-president of Brown House Stevens, uh, her partner in crime, Hal Wilkie's somewhere in the audience. He's waving at us there. And to our left is Sean Osher, who is the founder and CEO of Core. And to his left, complimenting my tie, and you know, the Sean wore the exact same suit that I did. I didn't expect that, so we have Diane as a buffer. Diane Ramirez, who is the chair and CEO of Halstead Property. So really excited to have everyone here. This is a market that people are still coming to terms with. Um, it's not down in the dumps in any way, but it's certainly a market that's changed from the exuberance of 2015, 2014. So we're gonna talk about some of the changes that have happened and how brokers are navigating them. I, I wanna start with uh, a listing that I read about a couple of weeks ago, 85 million at 42nd and 12th. And uh, I'll just, I just want to read you a couple of the perks that they're offering. 85, and 85 million, which is about $5,700 a square foot in Hell's Kitchen, or not even Hell's Kitchen, past that. Uh, they're offering a Lamborghini, two Rolls Royces, and two tickets to space. All right? this, is, this is actually on the listing. I bring this up not because, I bring it up because this used to happen all the time in 2014 and 2015. You saw stunt after stunt. You saw prices that were no longer in any sort of realm of reality. And now we bring it up because it's such, it's such a one-off. It's a rare thing. So my question is, is the era of aspirational pricing dead? Is it over? Have people come to a much more sensible uh, you know, stage in the market where prices are in line with what buyers are willing to pay? Sean, do you want to start us off? Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, we're still seeing record prices broken for really exceptional property. And I think regardless of where the market is, whether it's up or down, really beautiful property always sells at a premium. And uh, it remains to be seen if this will be sold, but that sounds like a marketing ploy to get PR and people speaking about it. So I guess it's successful in that um, way. Um, and, you know, the merits of the actual real estate will, you know, define whether it gets its price or not. But we're still seeing today record price, you know, record prices for property. Are you still seeing those big gaps in the market when we, I'm thinking of the triplex at the PR, actually one of BHS's listings at one point, um, you know, 125 million, I think it was asking for, it went for in the realm of 70 or somewhere like that. Uh, have, have prices settled down or asking prices settle down, Bess? I think that the, there has definitely been a price correction in our market, and I think we are uber price sensitive still and a very value driven market. And the last few years have been fairly flat for Manhattan real estate. So I think if sellers overprice, it's going to languish and stay on the market. But things that are priced right do sell. It takes a little bit longer, but I mean, this is not a time to price high or be aggressive. It just will sit on the market for a long time. But how do you convey that to your sellers when you know there's other brokerages or more brokers who might be taking, willing to take a risk with those prices and say, sure, I can get you 7,000 a foot when it's in reality maybe worth uh, 4,500 or 5,000 a foot? 
I, they look foolish. I mean, we all know that you want to you want to have a listing, not to collect it, but you want to sell it. And so I think that it's a bait and switch, and you want to make sure you tell sellers correct information. You want to substantiate why you think you can get the price you can get. You don't want to pretend and you know play games with them. You want to give them information that's solid and concrete, so they can trust you and work with you in the future. And it's a big waste of time to overprice. And, and I want to add to that, does it really matter whether you're the first agent? You want to be the agent that closes it. We recently closed one. We were the third agent. Of course, the price had come down significant, but our agent was the one that hit the mark and knew it, and they succeeded. So I'd rather be the third and close it than the first and, and play games with the seller. Mm -hmm. In terms of these headline deals, we've seen deals at 220 Central Park South, north of 200 million is one of the deals that we've seen. Uh, 520 Park Avenue hit some new records. There are deals like that happening in the market, but Raphael, when, when brokers, younger brokers, maybe brokers on your team or colleagues that you've seen come into the market and say, yeah, I want to be the guy or girl selling that listing, or I want to be, that's the action, that's what I want to build my career around. How do you, how do you talk them off that, that path, or is that path sustainable? I'm trying to think, but I don't recall any instance where a new agent said that to me, frankly. Um, and if they did, I would have probably told them immediately, start with rentals and, you know, advising friends and family. Um, so. I think, I think there can be a misconception that you kind of come in at that point in the market, but almost nobody does that. And the reality is that that's not where the majority of the transactions are taking place. Um, you know, I thought it was really interesting when we did our prep call, Raphael, and you talked about the fact that the majority of your business is in the sort of between three and five million dollars. Um, that's certainly where we see the majority of the transactions that I think power all of the brokerages in New York City taking place. So somebody who is like, I'm only gonna do the you know, $20 million deal and up, I actually think would find that their pockets were relatively you know, less full than somebody who had a much more diverse um, group of clients. And the reality of the type of clients we work with in our fundamentally relationship-driven business is that, you know, you're not going to say no when your best client asks you to find a home for their daughter or their niece or, um, you know, this is a business that's really more about the quality of the relationship than the size of the transaction. And Raphael, you had said, specifically you had said, I make my money between 4.5 and 4.7 million, right? Yeah. Has, that, has that shifted? Is that, where were you, made, let's say, three years ago? I would have said the same thing three years ago. So it's a lot of that, and then it's punctuated by big ones a couple times a year, more or less. Okay. So when, when you're running a brokerage and you're, you're dealing with uh, a luxury market that's, that's stuttering a little bit, how do you keep brokers motivated? How do you keep them, uh, you know, if, if, they're, if you've got to bring them down, hey, maybe you're not going to sell the $20 million listing that you were selling five years ago or 10 years ago, or let's say three, four years ago, now you've got to focus on the volume and at the two or $3 million range. So tell us a little bit about those conversations you have, because a lot of what you do is, is part psychologist, part cheerleader, part coach, right? So talk a little bit about it. Right. it Right. You, you are all of those. I think an agent always just has to look to where is their business coming. And if you happen to have a, a seller at that level, terrific. But if that's what you're looking for, I agree. You're, you're really going to not have to work very often. So you, you, work for your, you work at your sphere of influence. You sure that they're constantly evolving, constantly learning, constantly looking to how else or what else can I do to bring more business to it. So the reality is you should be looking at the price tag, you should be looking at doing the deal, because deals create deals. So whatever it is you're looking at, however you can get to that sphere, be it social media, be it old fashioned snail mail, whatever it is, the networking, you know, I always say if you're not networking, you're not working. So that's what we just encourage them is try to continually just work to be in the in the game and the being in the game brings more business. And it and it and it does work. I, I think the other thing, the one kind of positive thing that Andrew said out of that whole depressing thing that he 
came up here and spoke about was, you know, agents need to be fluent with the product. They need to know the inventory. And that would be a great thing to do in this environment is to know what projects are coming up, what's selling, uh, what's on the market. And something that Hall always says, which is super important, is to put your client's interest first above your own. And I think if you do that, you will have repeat business. It will just keep coming because you're putting their interest first, not your commission, but you're thinking about them. You provided me a good transition into the only question I'm going to ask about town. And I said, and said to Raphael on the call too, I'm not interested in grave dancing. But what I am interested in understanding is what lessons did you take from the demise of town? What lessons did you take for your firms, for your brokers? How do you communicate? OK, look, this can happen to even a high-flying firm like town. Sean? I mean, I think the biggest thing I disagree with that was said was that a traditional brokerage is not a sustainable business model. Um, I think if that was the case, none of us would be sitting up here. I think it's very sustainable if it's run a certain way and effectively. I think um, if you can applaud for that if you want. <laughs> um, I, won't, I won't comment about town, but I think you know, everyone here is with a company that has a little bit of a difference in their business model, and uh, clearly it's working for us. I mean, personally speaking, our first quarter of this year was our strongest quarter, and we've been in business nearly 12 years, so it was our best quarter. Um, I think markets like this bring great opportunities to great brokers. And something we need to remember is that, you know, we don't really care whether the market's up or down. Obviously, for our clients, we do. But, you know, we need to um, have our, our, our finger on the pulse, know where the market is, and transact. And great brokers in a troubling market will do successfully. Um, and, and they'll do better than the average broker. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. And I just want to say one thing back to the last question. Uh, any broker who finds it difficult to get motivated to get out of bed to do a $2 million deal has got bigger issues. Because if you look at what we're selling and what we get paid for what we do relative to every single other market in the world, um, I think you know, we get paid very healthily for the job we do. And I'm not saying it's an easy job because it's a very difficult job, but I think we're compensated very handsomely and a $2 million transaction at a 6% commission is still more than the annual salary of a teacher in the United States. So I think we should be very proud of what we do and be highly motiv motivated to get out of bed to do a $2 million deal. That's a fair point. Well said. I do, I do want to jump in um, and comment on, I think, the story that's being told about uh, the collapse of town right now, and particularly the use of the word disruption, because so much of my life, you know, my, I have a funny division in my life where I'm both um, operationally running um, a brokerage that I'm so proud to be involved with, and then I'm, I'm also directly investing in disruptive companies, right? Um, and disruption is like beach erosion. It's not a tsunami. Mm -hmm. So if you build your house on the edge of the beach and the sand keeps slipping out from under you, and then you say that a tsunami, you know, it was a tsunami that came and took your house. There's some disingenuity to that. <laughs> um, you know, we can all see the disruption happening in the industry, but it's happening at a pace that can be responded to by intelligent, sophisticated people like the people on this panel. Um, and I, I do, with that said, want to say that I actually also think that Andrew was really a visionary in terms of what he saw for the industry and the placement of town. And, you know, I think it's the loss of town is really, um, it, you know, tragic in the classical sense of the word in that I think his instincts were really correct about so many things. I think that there is really a need for a modern luxury firm that's focused, you know, that focused on the needs of the brokers above all. I think Andrew always had a commitment to his agents. He wanted to create an environment that was um, literally and figuratively rich for his um, agents to operate in. And I think all of those things are things that um, we are smart to observe as his competitors, because there was a lot about town that was really, really right on. He, he created a culture. It was something that was special in the sense that his agents 
were loyal to him and he created something special from the ground up, so that was incredible. But the collapse of town didn't happen overnight, as Claudia said. It's like a relationship. You don't just wake up and say, let's get divorced. I mean, over time, it, 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 you know, it starts to fall apart, and I think that's what happened with town, and it was, it's unfortunate. To your point, Claudia, there's a, there's a level of fascination about town which was outsized even for it being a big firm. There was any time we did a story about town, it was just everyone responded to it. So I think there is something of that culture creation there. Uh, Raphael, I wanted to bring you on. Um, you're with Douglas Elliman, but, but to a lot of people, you're known as Rafael De Niro. The name Douglas Elliman is an afterthought. Some people in the industry might know, but buyers probably see you and say, hey, Raphael, word of mouth, someone else comes to you, and that's how I'm assuming, I'm not sure, but I'm assuming that's how you've built a lot of your business. Uh, my question is, in an era where you've got such a big book of business, you've got your own brand recognition, and you've got a roster of clients that you can turn to over and over as they buy or move on, um, why stay with a big brokerage? What's the point? Sure. So over the long haul, um, you want to be a listing agent, right? Um, and in order to do that effectively, you need a big platform and a lot of resources and a lot of infrastructure behind you. Um, and a lot of my business is listing business, and I'm quite certain that a probably 70% of it would be out of my reach if I didn't have a Corcoran or a Brown Harris or a Core or an Element behind me. Um, so that's the first and foremost reason. Um, as far as agents in general, um, there's a lot of efficacy, I think, to joining a big firm. One of the things that had occurred to me over the last couple of days um, when I was thinking about this panel was that <clears throat> if you're a person who doesn't know anybody in New York City and you land here, you parachute into Manhattan, you're from Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or wherever. Um, if you join a big firm, if you're able to work your way up the ranks of that firm, you're going to be plugged into a network of thousands of people instantly. Developers, um, other brokers who can potentially give you referral business. So that's something to consider, I think, for people. I think the other thing, too, for someone as spectacular as Raphael is, you are a rainmaker. You your skill is your, your customer service, your sphere of influence, being out there. So you having the, the backup of, of your firm, Douglas Elliman, or in our firm, or any of our firms, having that for your big producers or any size producer. I mean, we have, we've got your back. We've got your legal. You've got an HR issue. You hired someone you, that didn't work out. You can hand that over to us, know that we've got your back, and you continue to do what you do brilliantly and be the rainmaker. And I think that's part of the reason why you're so successful and others like you are so successful is that you realize is what you do is great, but what we do for you is, is something that's also quite special. And the combination is what I think is really magical. And, and I think that's why there aren't a million Rafael De, De Niro's companies out there. Our, our teams stay with us and understand the true value that we have for you. Do you make money off a Rafael De Niro type, given the high commission splits, the pie yes. marketing? Absolutely, absolutely. They do, think, trust me. Think of, think of the volume that he is doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if it's a smaller percentage, and, and we in New York are blessed. I see a lot of things nationally, and, mm -hmm. and you know, even firms that are down in Florida and whatever, the splits are really incredibly um, challenged. But in New York, we still maintain really fair, fair splits for the corporate, and it's an expensive city, so it makes sense. But when you think of the volume that Raphael does, and us getting, or the company getting a small piece of that, it equals to what probably our, our middle range agents are bringing us to us as well, and, and, and they don't have the star power of Raphael. You mentioned commission splits, which is a great point for, for the next question is, we're seeing a lot of national infiltration, maybe not as successfully as, as some of these national players would like, but there's certainly some shifts, there's some national players coming in. Are they bringing with them that pressure on commission splits, and if so, how are you navigating them? Let's say New York is a 70-30 town or a 60-40 town, whereas in LA, 90-10 seems to be the norm, right? Is that coming into New York, and how the hell do you deal with that if it does? I don't think they're bringing it in to lower it. I think they're coming into because ours is so attractive. Mm -hmm. 
So it, I don't think the... In terms of the, the ability or the tolerance for those kind of splits is what I mean. Right, but I don't necessarily think the company dictates what the split will be in that region. For instance, we have firms on this panel that have offices. I have offices in Connecticut and New Jersey. Connecticut, the splits are far less attractive. I'm certainly not going to bring that back to New York. I will handle the intolerance of what I have to pay in Connecticut, but I'm not going to make that work here. And I, I think that you, that's what the companies are doing. You, you must compete in the market as the market is dictating, but that doesn't mean you make that your company policy. They have to adopt to our standards, and no one has been able to crack the New York market yet. Nobody's done it yet. They're trying to. Right, they're trying. They're getting a little, not quite. Yeah, I mean, you have companies like Berkshire Hathaway, which has a great brand, but you need, you know, the brand is one thing. You need the right people as well. You know, you need both of those things to be successful. So only time will tell. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I look to myself to say, you know, as a real estate agent many years ago, why was I attracted to a company that I worked at? I think, you know, different companies, the companies all represented up here are slightly different in, you know, some bigger ways, some smaller ways, but they attract a certain type of person to their respective culture. And I think that emanates from the top. I think um, a real estate company is only as good as its real estate agents. Uh, the agents are the ambassadors of the brand, and I think that is probably the most compelling reason why, you know, someone like Raphael works at Douglas Elliman, the brand, rep, you know, resonates with him and his business and is a good representation of him and his business. And I think that, you know, is probably respectively true for the most part. Um, you know, I think that's a reason why we don't see as much attrition as we probably would see for agents getting recruited for higher splits. Uh, and to go for things. I think culture is the intangible thing that's incredibly value, valuable in the minds of the real estate agent. But culture is, has got some weight, but then a signing bonus has a certain amount of weight as well, right? So how do, you, how do you counter that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, everyone wants the best deal, understandably, uh, but is it a best short-term deal? Is it a best long-term deal? Is it a transition? You know, a smart business person will take all of these things into consideration and make their respective decision. I think for the most part, agents are attracted to the brands that resonate most with them. Um, maybe the agent who's unsure could be persuaded one way or another with a signing bonus, um, but it's got to be a long-term. You know, this is not a business where you make a lot of money. This is not a quick buck business. You know, there's a, you know, Raphael's been doing this longer than he'd probably care to uh, face up to. But, you know, these businesses, being an agent, is built over a very long period of time. And it's not an easy business. It's not an easy business to build your brand in. So that decision is very important. Bess, yeah. have you changed anything? I do want to get but Bess, have you changed anything in your strategy in, in direct response to a firm coming in with a big signing bonus or a firm promising, for example, equity. Have you changed anything in the way that BHS does business? I mean, I, we haven't changed. We don't offer equity. Um, we don't do signing bonuses. We never will. We're not, gonna, we're not that type of a firm. We sell real estate. That's what we focus on every day, and we try to be the best at that. Um, but we have, you know, competition has inspired us to be better and get better and invest in more technology, more support, uh, great management, all those sorts of things. We just want to be the best. So we're, we keep striving and changing and evolving. And so we're not going to be doing copying with what a firm would do, like giving equity to an agent. It's just not the model for us. I just wanted to jump in and say, you know, we, we had two experiences in the kind of uh, Post town agent, uh, I'm not sure what you. It's only been it. three weeks. Um, a cat fight, <laughs> you know, where every where we were, um, there were so many good agents still left to town, and people were looking for their homes. And um, we had two different people who turned down signing bonuses to come to us. Like BHS, we don't give signing bonuses. We don't feel that um, that's part of who we are. Um, but I do think, you know, I think the brokerage is a business to business services company. And that actually even at 10%, 
that's a lot of your commission to give away, <laughs> and that we need to be really aware of what we're offering the agents who come and work with us. You know, I, I had an experience recently where one of my agents introduced me to someone and said, um, I work for her, and I started laughing. I was like, no, I work for you. <laughs> I work for you, um, because you're the one who you know, goes out and does the hard work. And I'm like the nerd who sits back in the office and tries to come up with the tools and the services that are going to help you sell more business. Um, I do just want to loop back and quickly say, I don't think that large, um, large firms from other parts of the country are going to come in and impact our commission splits. I think that SoftBank is going to impact our commission splits because SoftBank's policy in every company that it goes into is to try to burn the field around it mm -hmm. and establish market dominance in a way that then allows it to reset the economics of the business that it's operating in. I was just telling Raphael off stage that every time we'd write a story skeptical about Compass's business model or valuation or whatever, they'd raise another round to a point where they're like, okay, maybe we don't know what we're talking about. But I, I did want to bring you in, Raphael, on, uh, on something. When we're talking about tools and platforms, about a year ago, a uh, premier agent essentially came into the market and said, hey, look, uh, we're going to let brokers advertise on other brokers' listings. I'm technically not getting it quite correct, but that's the essence of it. How do you deal when, when what you're trafficking in is expertise, and product expertise? That's what you're about. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate having someone who may not have any experience, who may not have any you know, knowledge about the specific property or even the specific neighborhood, come in and essentially squat on your listing, and then I want to open this up to the brokerage executives as well. How do you navigate a force like that with so much, you know, they have a platform. It's a platform that all of you have been using for a long time, that you've fed essentially, and now you're saying, hey, wait a minute. So, Raphael, start with you. I'm not bothered by co-broking, right? So I don't care if someone shows up to my listing <clears throat> Uh, it is frustrating if they don't know what they're talking about or if they're not familiar with the product or the neighborhood um, or if they're not used to handling the type of tenant or buyer that they have. Uh, we had a situation recently where um, a 100% commission model broker from Great Neck showed up at a $45,000 a month rental in Tribeca with a tenant in tow who everyone in this room knows. And I couldn't believe it. Um, I, I was really shocked. And it ended up not working out. <clears throat> but the fact that I'm you know, now having to co-broke with people from Great Neck for Manhattan Rentals is pretty crazy. So it just kind of, I think, speaks to how much things are changing right now. Um, I was not supportive of Premier Agent. Um, I'm starting to change my philosophy a little bit. I'm kind of starting to adapt, starting to, adapt to if you can't beat them, join them philosophy. Um, we've tried it within my office, within my team. It works. Um, it works in for, terms of for, generating real leads for... Yeah, uh -huh. for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's legit. Um, that may change, but today it works. Well, I, I think that this... I, I feel very strongly about Premier Agent, and I don't... This is a situation where I think the, me, the means don't justify the ends. And um, recently, I think... Backing up for a second, Street Easy did used to provide a very valuable service. It was a place where everybody went, uh, buyers, sellers, uh, agents alike, and then uh, Premier Agent came on the scene, and there's, there, it was this whole misrepresentation as to who was the listing agent. And um, there was no vetting. We, like you said, Raphael, there's uh, an agent from uh, Great Neck who didn't know what they're doing. And so now the DOS recently has uh, ca came out with an opinion is going to modify premier agent so that the listing agent, the one that actually has the relationship with the client, will be clearly represented on the listing and there won't be some phone number just to call where it's a pay to play. And I think Brown Harris Stevens as a firm, we have not put one penny of corporate dollars behind Premier Agent because I feel strongly that it violates our core ethics as to what we stand for. And I think it's also, it's, it's like we're giving them the bullet and they have the gun to our heads. We're killing our own business. And I think it's a terrible thing. And I'm so, I wouldn't support it unless they modified how it's set up. So that's just my opinion. <laughs> Thank you.
I do want to apologize on behalf of everyone who's from Great Neck. It's a beautiful town, just as an example, but Dan, let's, uh, let's bring I love Great Neck. Well, I, was, I was just going to add that uh, I think Department of State, right from the beginning, we knew that this was inherently wrong. Uh, we were deceiving the consumer. And I think what I have particularly seen in the months that it has happened is that the consumer now, one of the first questions they're asking the agents that respond is, are you the listing agent? So I think in a subtle way, it's helped educate the consumer that they don't want the agent to show up with this exalted title of premier agent that knows absolutely nothing about the product. But I think the Department of State has acknowledged it. I, I think it's going to be a fair playing field going forward with all the players correctly identified. And um, it still will be a lead generation concept for the agents that choose to do that. And uh, I think in the end, it's, it's going to play out very well. There's a couple of things that I want to push back. One is your own brokers are using the platform. They are increasingly so. The other thing is relying on the DOS to actually take a step in any reasonable amount of time seems a little bit unrealistic. And that's what we've seen all across. There's enforcement is, is really difficult for them when they're, they're just the, the way the resources are set up. So. Right, but and enforcement it will. I mean, it took them a, a very long time to come to this unofficial opinion, so it's not even truly official yet. But again, I think the consumer is much more educated about who they're dealing with. And agents have had great success. We personally are working with the premier broker scenario because there's much more accountability on that. We know which, which agents are responding, which ones are getting deals. We are see deals being done with that particular one. We will not get involved corporately with the premier agent as well. But I do know there are agents in our firm that are using it and the ones that and are really persistent about following up on it, are doing deals on it. Uh, but from a corporate standpoint, I like the transparency and accountability uh, of the tests we're doing with Premier Broker. I think that's a fair answer. I, I want to pivot and talk a little bit about just the actual places where deals are getting done. Uh, Raphael, question for you since you brought up the rental market. Uh, you're seeing record concessions across the city on all sectors, luxury, you're seeing two months free rent, you're seeing a uh, drop in rental prices. I wouldn't say everywhere, but there are a lot of places that we're seeing this. How is that affecting the investment properties that a lot of buyers or you know, people in the one to five million range who wanted to generate income as opposed to buying for, you know, for sport? It's, it's a problem. Um, Bloomberg put out an article, I think it was this fall or last summer, that basically I think it was the said, real deal, but that's fine. That's yeah, fine. sorry. Um, it basically said that you're better off buying a treasury, right, than buying an apartment and, and hoping to get, you know, a 1.5% return, whereas in 14, my clients were buying apartments and getting a 4.5% return. The exception, I think, are buildings that have uh, very sort of long 421As, so if you look at like Waterline Square or One Manhattan Square, if you have a 20 or 25 year tax abatement, I think you can still eke out a pretty decent return, but otherwise, um, not so much. And uh, you know, if you look at traffic and new developments, it used to be like 30, 35 percent investors, and it's not the case anymore. Um, and that at least partially explains the slowdown in new development. Are you navigating them to different parts of the market, or is it just just no solution at the moment? You know, typically with buyers, you know, we try to tell them um, unless they specifically um, are looking to invest, we try to tell them to hold their apartments for five to eight years because we never want to be in a situation where we sell someone something and two years later they want to resell it and then we have to tell them that they're underwater. Um, so uh, for the most part, um, m most of our business is, is actually users, end users, real people who are going to live in their apartments and use them. So. Sean, same question for you, just in terms of pockets of opportunity. Uh, some places are drying up. I, I know you're involved on the west side quite a bit. Talk a little bit about where the next big deals are, the next great values are for, for buyers here. Um, I think downtown, there's a lot of activity. By downtown, I mean south of Canal Street, um, what we used to refer to as the financial district. Um, I think that neighborhood, you know, there's been over $30 billion 
of um, investment gone into that neighborhood from what Brookfield did all the way through to the east side of the seaport. Um, every time I walk down the, you know, the downtown area there, there's something new and exciting about it. And I think it used to be a destination that was a value destination. Um, and now I see price, you know, prices going up. Um, I think, you know, 30 Park Place was a visionary pioneering project that got a higher average price per foot than a lot of projects in much more prime locations traditionally. Um, so I think there's, there are a lot of exciting pockets. Obviously, West Chelsea and Hudson Yards, you know, Hudson Yards being the largest development in the history of the United States. There's still another 20 million square feet of west of the yards that will be developed over the next 20 years. Um, so, you know, we're an island um, under, you know, extreme zoning um, laws that limit how much can be built, but there's still a lot out there that's going to be developed over time, and I think we're going to see new neighborhoods evolve. The interesting thing to me is that um, when I moved to New York in the late 80s, uh, the Village, Soho, Tribeca, all of these were where the artists would go and they were cheap. Um, the average price per foot for an apartment now is higher than the average price per foot for an apartment uptown. So downtown is actually flipped, um, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. So if you look at the Upper East Side, I think there's some great opportunities there. Um, and of course, you know, what, what we've seen happen in Brooklyn, that's a whole other panel for a whole other conversation. Uh, but there's a lot of exciting opportunity pretty much anywhere you look. And if you're educated about the market, you can find opportunity in any neighborhood. I, I wanted to bring you in and ask you, uh, Diane, about townhouses. Um, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk that the townhouse market was dead. Then you see a record-breaking deal. Then it, it sort of cools off for a little bit. What's actually going on with uh, luxury townhouses? Well, I, I've watched the townhouse market for a, a long time. And to me, it's an extremely cyclical market. When you look at them, they're basically beautiful, great space. And then you have the comparison is, you know, an apartment or a townhouse. You have the wonderful privacy of it. There's the security issues. Mm -hmm. So I think when the, the apartment prices get a little bit pricey, all of a sudden the townhouses seem like a fabulous alternative because it's good value usually. And then that market heats up and it gets too expensive and then you realize, well, I could get a great apartment for the same price as a townhouse and I don't have the issues. I think right now the townhouse market is a little over And I think that's, that's what you're seeing, but it's extremely cyclical. The prices will come down, they'll become great value again, a great option, and the cycle begins again. And that, I really just think we're in the middle of a, a too pricey cycle for townhouses. And does it tend to be just the New York buyer that's looking at a townhouse, or do you see activity from foreign buyers as well? It, it depends. Foreign buyers will certainly uh, buy townhouses, particularly if they have staff and they're bringing, coming forward with staff. But otherwise, it, it's often the, uh, the families that want a wonderful place for their fa families to grow up and, and have some privacy in a backyard um, that, that leans towards that. But if you have staff, definitely uh, for the foreigners. That's, and it's certainly, if you're looking for pre-war and charm, um, you're not necessarily going to get into every great pre-war apartment, so it is, to some extent, an option for you as a foreigner. Clearly, you, you recently came on. I, I don't know how long you've been at Warburg, but I know you became president maybe a year and a half, two years ago. You had the difficult task of sort of taking that brokerage into the 21st century. Uh, love to get your thoughts on what changed, what you found the most resistance to, and. Um, what lessons you learned from there? I think, uh, I think that's my father shouting from the background. Uh, <laughs> I still read your blog, by the way. <laughs> he's, been, he's been heckling everyone today. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, you know, I, I grew up with real estate, but I never in a million years thought that this is <coughs> what I would do. Um, I had a much more sort of conventional business career. I actually was kind of a change and disruption expert 
um, at the Boston Consulting Group for a number of years. And when my father, to his credit, started talking to me four or five years ago about the fact that he felt like things were really changing in the industry. And, um, you know, again, to the discussion we were having before that uh, disruption is like beach erosion, not a tsunami, he said, I, I, I see that something is changing in the industry. And when I came in, I did a sort of classic BCG study for the company, and I was like, you're right, I think that you're in the midst of a disruption cycle. And, you know, the, things, the thing that was glaringly obvious to me at that time was that we'd really shifted from being the guardians of information to being professional services providers, right? And that, that's a fundamental shift in terms of the service that brokers were offering to their buyers and sellers. So we, we thought about, well, how does that change what we need to offer to our agents because the brokerage is a service provider? Um, and we really saw, I mean, I think we saw together that um, one of the core aspects of that was providing more of a platform for brokers around their own brands. And that's been something that we embraced really early and have worked hard to build a platform for agents at our company to, you know, sort of brand themselves, not unlike, you know, what you've done brilliantly. Um, and I think also to, you know, obviously I'm very passionate about technology. I have this like side gig where I run a venture fund. <laughs> um, you know, I actually invest in companies that are disrupting the space, but I really believe that um, high touch, high value brokerage will endure. It's what we've seen happen in all, you know, even think about what's happened with the travel agent, that the travel agent was disrupted, but now there are all of these new businesses that are like, we've got this crazy new idea, there's gonna be a person who helps you make your reservations. Um, and um, I think that speaks to the fact that for, for things that are complicated, we're, you know, as humans, we like to have other humans involved, and there's nothing that's more of a head and heart decision than where you're gonna live. Um, so I, I really feel like for us as a brokerage, at this point, it's you know combining the best of the platform that my father has built over the last 30 years, and you know that's about professionalism, intelligence, ethics, with my you know interest in technology, marketing, um, and it has not always been easy for us. You know, I like to say that in the patriarchy, we all work for our father, but I actually work for my own father. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bess, uh, you're, you're with a firm that I believe the Twitter handle, at least until recently, said established 1873, right? Correct. And, or 1873 is correct, right? Um, how are you taking the firm into the, and, and I know there's a lot more news to come, but, but talk a little bit about those challenges. Well, I, I think that the good news is for Brown Harris Stevens, we have a great history and great records of sales. and. Um, when I joined the firm five years ago to work alongside Hall, um, you know, we both saw that there were a lot of things that needed to be changed. And one of the big things that we wanted to do was rebrand the company because although it was in, an incredible brand, probably the most important thing that we have, it was getting a little bit tired. So that was one of the things that we wanted to do and we did so very successfully and we're very excited about it. But we also have brought in a glut of new agents, younger agents, uh, millennials, uh, new blood, so to speak, which has been wonderful. We have a new training, we have new technology, uh, we have new offices, new managers. So the firm has grown slowly. We've never been about quantity, but about quality. And we've tried to do that. And we're similar in many ways to what Clelia was saying to Warburg. I know Fred and Hall are good friends, and they have very similar philosophies as to how they have uh, led their firms. And um, I feel similar to Clelia that I'm kind of the new guard, and I'm proud to be a part of something that is, has such integrity and high ethics. It's a great place to work. So. With your operating an environment, I, I, and I, again, Raphael, I know you're, you're known as uh, someone who keeps up with pretty much all the news and the reports. The last thing that I read was that closings were down 25% year over year this quarter, uh, first quarter. Contract activity has also been down. Uh, do you think this is a temporary blip based on rising interest rates, or do you see this as the new normal? Activity is down, and I think that's a cause for concern for a lot of people. Yeah. I really don't know. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, it seems like there's been a pickup since April, um, at least for, for my team's business. Um, I still think that we're 
in the midst of an acute oversupply of luxury apartments. And that's a situation that's sort of unique to Manhattan and even maybe Brooklyn to some extent, but really Manhattan and Miami. Um, and we still haven't worked through all of that inventory because when you look at all the other indicators, the economy is generally good. Um, you know, the sky isn't falling. We're not in the wake of Lehman Brothers or the wake of 9-11. So there's no real catalyst to point to. Um, so maybe it's a case of doing 75 miles an hour instead of 100 miles an hour that we were doing in 06 and 07 in the first half of 08 and in 13 and 14 in the first half of 15. Um, we, meaning my team, we noticed the slowdown in June 15, way before you guys reported it, way before anyone else. Thank you. Um, and which is usually the case, right? Because we're in the trenches and we see it right away. Um, so maybe this is normal. I don't know. Do you think the fundamentals have shifted to allow for that to be corrected? The land prices are still very high. Air rights prices are still very high. So when developers buying, they're saying they can't pencil out anything except luxury condos. So I wonder if that oversupply is going to be addressed in, in any meaningful way. I'm not sure. Um, typically what happens, um, at the end of a cycle like this, there, there actually ends up being a dearth of supply, right? So I, I feel like that might happen, um, but I don't know when. Uh, I think we might be another year or two or three away from that. Dan, where are you at on the market right now? Activity is down. How do you, how do you feel? Yeah, activity for the first quarter was down, but it, it seems very similar to what, what it was at the end of 16. I, th I think we just have cyclical cycles. Uh, the end of 16, we were dealing with the elections, we were dealing with Brexit, and our first quarter was slower to start up. That year, it really ended in November. This past year, with the tax law, we saw the trepidation on the parts of the buyer really going through to December. So I only saw our agents getting really busy again at the end of December. And so you add the, the fact that the buyers had to get back up and, and, and going. And then you add the additional choice that they have, which always slows down your decision to be able to make um, the, put your pen to paper. So I just think it's been a slower quarter, but I see it as, as just another quarter and it, it will pick up. There's no set things that's saying this is going to be um, a downward market. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that there's still an enormous amount of uncertainty in our market, and that's never good for real estate. So I think globally, politically, there's, there's that sentiment. And so that impacts our market. So we've had a slight correction, but it's OK to have a correction. I think that's healthy. And you know, supply and demand, once they intersect, the market will be more fluid. But overall, we're doing relatively very well, considering all of that. On that optimistic note, I do want to open it up to questions. I can only take two, so if you have a question, please put your hand up. Someone will come with a mic. We see anyone? Uh, any of our assistants? Anyone here? This way. Right, second row, right in the middle. <laughs> and I just request that you ask one question, and it be a question. Thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question, because we have a lot of talk about premier agent and the trend and what's going on with the industry. And I have an impression that uh, we talk a lot about the, uh, the selling agents, because uh, listing agents, because that's basically what this industry is supposed to be. But realistically, I think most of the agents do dual uh, role, meaning that they are, most of them are buyer's agent and seller's agent. Mm -hmm. so, I am always for transparency, but however... Sorry, what is the question? We do have to get to the question. And the question is, what's your views about uh, the protection to the listing agents versus my, my as agent? Because not everybody is listing agents. I mean, I, I think there's two sides to every deal, right? So, and it's very rare now that you handle both sides of the transaction. So I think Premier Agent is just one of many, 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 many tools um, you know, any great broker, I don't know of one great broker in the city who's built their business off premier agent. Now maybe they're out there uh, and they're using that tool very effectively and they're spending a lot of money generating a lot of leads and closing the leads, but at the end of the day your business is going to come down to being successful because of who you are and how you can close a deal, regardless of where the lead comes from. 
Um, and it, that's really what it boils down to. And we'll take one just, more question. Can I just jump in and say quickly, in terms of the disruption that we are seeing in the industry, there are going to be platforms that basically do, you know, will do an entire transaction without an agent or only bring in humans for certain parts of the transaction. And what I say to my agents is, I don't think Premier Agent is a sustainable platform to build a business because the people who are going to Premier Agent are the people who are going to most quickly move to those other platforms. They don't have a relationship with you. They don't care about you. They don't feel a connection with you. Referrals are the gold of this business. And the people who build businesses that are sustainable are going to be people who can build relationships by offering true value to their clients on both sides of the transaction. We'll, we'll take one more and that's about it. Anyone on this side? We feel like we've ignored this side of the room a little bit. No? Anyone else? All right. We'll wrap it up then. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for our panelists.